Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and latest games from August 1987. I take a look at software protection. I play some older games. Take a look at a newer title. Jeff continues with his Willy mods. And we end with the extra bit. But first, it's the news. The long-awaited Matthew Smith game, Attack of the Mutant Zombie Flesh-Eating Chickens from Mars, has been put on hold, with Matthew being unhappy with how it's looking. He plans to take it apart and rebuild it bit by bit, before releasing it. Adventure games are popular on all micros, and Angular Television are about to launch a new series based on these very games. Called Nightmare, the program will involve four people, one of whom wears a helmet restricting their vision. The others then guide them around dungeons, caves and mansions trying to solve puzzles. A game based on the show is said to be in the pipeline, but Activision, who have been linked with the development, are keeping quiet. The as yet unreleased Spectrum Plus 3 has already run into trouble, but this time not about hardware. The big problem this time for retailers and the public is the price. Amstrad initially stated that the new machine would sell for £249, a lot higher than the markets anticipated. Pressure also comes from the newer 16-bit machines being reduced, like the Atari 520 STFM, dropping to just £299. Considering the hardware differences, Amstrad price doesn't justify the technology gap. Amstrad though are currently refusing to drop the price, at least for now. Automata UK, the company that gave us the Pie Man and huge prize money games like Uncle Groucho, has been bought by Interceptor Micros. Interceptor claim they will keep the label alive, promising four new games in the next four weeks. Two will be Spectrum games called Asiento and Sword of Kings. Sadly, Interceptor also confirmed they would not be using the Pie Man character in any new titles, but may keep him as a logo on the game inlays. Sir Clive has long been working on wafer scale technology, and managed to keep hold of it during the sell-off to Amstrad. His company, Animatic, has been busy and have now got £4 million worth of backing from a variety of companies including Tandem Computers and Barclays Bank. He is not alone seeking to conquer this technology though. His major rivals include IBM and Texas Instruments. If successful, we may begin to see the fruits of over five years worth of work starting to appear in the next 12 months. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. New into the chat this month is Wonder Boy from Activision. Army Moves from Ocean. Roadrunner from US Gold. Game Over from Ocean. And Exelon from Houston Consultants. And that was the news and top selling games from August 1987. Wherever there has been something that can be copied, there has inevitably been copy protection systems. They have been in place since the early days of the Spectrum. They were created to prevent the obstacle that was hindering the company's piracy. Over time they became more and more complicated, but occasionally the schemes themselves would get in the way of legitimate users. Protection began in a very simple way, disabling the break key. This method was relatively simple at first, and involved hacking the system so that if the break key was pressed, the system would crash. Examples of this kind of protection can be found in Horace Goes Skiing and Incentives Millionaire. It was, however, incredibly easy to bypass, and you could just get round it by using the merge command. Most copying software at the time would also copy this type of program. Since the data was saved using the ROM routines, it was also incredibly easy to just make direct tape-to-tape -tape copies. Another sneaky method was to try and fool the user into thinking the game was machine code, when in actual fact it was basic. A good example of this is Transylvanian Tower by Richard Shepard Software. The game begins to load with the code prefix, but is actually basic. As the fight moved on, the next stage was headerless data blocks. A slightly more advanced method from around the same time that modified the data so that it was impossible to load code direct from BASIC, instead requiring a special piece of machine code. Usually program code was loaded in two sections, the header, which contained details about the size and location, followed by the data block itself. Without the header though, 
straightforward copying was difficult. An example of this can be seen in 3D Death Chase. While this protection scheme was difficult to break for casual users, people with a basic knowledge of machine code found it easy to get around. Most often you could just use the merge command, have a look at the basic, and move on from there. Around this time, software copying programs started to spring up, like the key, which could handle this kind of protection system. Another early trick, only suitable for basic programs, involved putting in invalid control codes inside the listing, but basic programs became less and less as the game industry began to evolve. Things began to get a little more technical as things moved forward with special loaders instead of the Sinclair ROM routines. Speed loaders were created to load files faster than the original ROM routines and act as protection at the same time. The most infamous of these was Speedlock, which was programmed in 1983 by David Aubrey Jones and David Looker. This loading scheme had a distinct sound with a set of audible clicks in the header tone. This and the high speed loading made Speedlock very difficult to copy using tape to tape methods. However, copiers for Speedlock programs soon cropped up, such as the Lerm tape utility. Ultimate Play the Game, US Gold and Ocean were among those who used Speedlock extensively for their programs. As well as Speedlock, there was also Alcatraz, another popular protection scheme, which had the ability to animate loading screens during the load process. Examples of this can be seen in Cobra, Poppy Bearing, where the game's plot is explained in a scrolly message, and Trantor the Last Stormtrooper. Like Speedlock, it was difficult to copy using tape to tape, but also like Speedlock, copier programs soon cropped up. Along came Bleepload with a strange loading scheme because it loaded programs in blocks of 250 bytes each. The amount of blocks and the gap between them made Bleepload programs very difficult to copy using standard copy programs. Examples of this are Gunstar and The Pawn, as well as many Firebird games. This block loading system also had a serious disadvantage. The separate blocks meant that most of the tape was taken up by the header tones, which slowed down loading considerably. As the schemes became more and more difficult to crack using software programs, it was time for another approach. Hardware. All schemes became null and void when Multiface arrived from Romantic Robot. It could copy all the programs released with just a single press of the button. Once halted, the user could then save all of the RAM to tape. It also had a built-in monitor, which meant the games could be inspected and hacked, and this was a great problem for software companies, as it allowed copying of any program by just pressing a button. With software and now hardware schemes being defeated, the companies turned to yet another option, off-tape protection. The most notable scheme was Padlock, used by software projects, amongst others. This involved a coloured card which contained codes for the game. When the game was loaded, it asked for the code on the card. If the code was wrong, player was given another few chances, after which the game reset. The tape itself was easy to copy, but the coloured card was difficult to reproduce at the time because colour photocopiers were quite rare and expensive. However, with the tape being unprotected, like Jet Set Willy for example, it was easy to go in and poke the code after the game had loaded. Another off-tape protection system was Lens Lock, perhaps the silliest type of protection scheme. It used a physical device, which consisted of a bit of plastic inset with a set of prisms. A scrambled code would appear on the screen, and Lens Lock could be used to descramble it. At least that was the idea. Lens Lock wouldn't work on televisions that were too large or too small, and the adjustment instructions originally supplied was a little unclear. 
the biggest fault was that occasionally the lens lock would be mixed up with the wrong tape during shipping, so it wouldn't work at all. There were other schemes in existence and different versions of the ones mentioned here. Some relied on words on the inlay or in the manual of the game itself. These particular types were easy to circumvent and like all protection schemes that came before, proved that it only stopped playground copiers and had very little impact on mass piracy. Like today, if someone wanted to copy your game, they could, and there was very little you could do about it. Modern games, however, now come with internet protection schemes, and some require always-on connectivity to the company's servers, which wasn't available in the Spectrum days, and this made it necessary to write, modify and invent software protection. A special mention must also go to a device created by JLC, which was blocked by the Ministry of Defence because it was too good and could be used to protect data that they might want to get at. From what is known, it consisted of a small chip inside a cassette that had to be there for the software to run. A second signal was then imprinted underneath the main data on the tape that checked for the presence of the chip. Because the Ministry of Defence confiscated all material relating to this, the public will never really know what it actually did. From the data available though, unless the device continually checked for the chip, it would be easy to copy once the game had loaded into memory. Copy protection will always be around, despite the fact that it's often only valid users who are affected by it, and it is often overlooked in the modern world of SD card interfaces and emulation, where games can load instantly. I bet there are few of you out there that actually sit down and load Spectrum games at normal speed with a tape recorder, and to be honest, I don't blame you. It was interesting though, to see some of these loaders in action, especially Alcatraz with its animation features, something often overlooked when emulating older machines. This is Trantor the Last Stormtrooper, released by Go in 1987. Trantor has been betrayed and left alone on an alien planet. There are no further details about this, but the intro animation gives you some sort of idea of what happened. Left alone, it's now a race against time to activate the transporter so he can escape and presumably take revenge. To escape, he has to run around the alien complex trying to locate eight terminals. Each one will hold a letter for the activation code. Of course, it's never that easy and there is a very tight time limit. This can be seen ticking down at the top of the screen and to be honest, you're far too busy trying not to get killed. As you run around, there are various containers that, when examined, will produce health, reset the timer, or refill your weapon's energy. To examine them, you just crouch down in front of them. On to the game then, and as you can see, the graphics are very nice. Large and well animated, and smooth. The character can run, crouch and jump, as well as fire his flamethrower. There is always something to shoot, but because of the time limit, it's sometimes best to just run and hope you can find the next health pickup. There are lifts to other levels, each one having detailed backgrounds, often changing to give a variety of different areas. Sound is well used too, with some nice music on the start screen and good effects for various elements of the game. As a game though, I'm not too convinced. That time limit is a real killer and you have to learn the game map to survive. Even then it can be tricky. There's no time to stop and fire. You just have to keep hurtling forwards, looking for health pickups and terminals. Once you have all the eight letters, you head off in search of the transporter so you can enter the code and escape. I never got all eight letters and did have a fair few tries at it. The first couple were wasted because I was wandering about admiring the graphics and trying to shoot everything, which soon ended in frustration as the timer kept running out. Decent game then, and one that shows off what the Spectrum can do, but just be prepared for a lot of frustration until you learn the game map. This is 3D Grand Prix, released by Zeppelin Games in 1991. There were many Super Sprint clones around for the Spectrum, many coming from Codemasters, but there were a few other companies producing the same kind of material too. Enter Zeppelin Games and their version.
the instructions are very sparse, and it took me a few plays to get to grips with the little nuances of this game. For those who care, my car is the Scion one, and yes, I'm having a bad time of things. The circuits are drawn well, but if you watch carefully, you'll notice that the cars are visible when they go under the bridges. It doesn't really affect the gameplay, but it can just put you off a little bit when you cross paths with other cars. Accelerating is done in stages by continually pressing the accelerator key. So you press it once to start off at slow speed, you press it again in your speed increases, again and again until you reach full speed. Something missing from the instructions. And I spent ages wondering why all the other cars were faster than me. Once up to speed though, the game becomes much more playable as you turn into the bends and skid around corners. If you do crash, either into the scenery or other cars, you will sustain damage, and too much of this will ruin your engine, which means you can't accelerate through all the stages, and sometimes you end up crawling around the track until you get into the pits. Once you get into the pits, you wait there for a couple of seconds and your car's repaired and you can carry on the race. To progress to the other tracks, you just have to complete the course in time. You don't necessarily have to win. Just make sure you get to the finish line. The courses vary in complexity, from fairly simple to pretty difficult, and all of them are drawn in one colour. The cars are drawn really nicely, and have some lovely animation as they hurtle around the track, despite being tiny. Sound is well used too, with some really nice engine sounds and skidding. Once you get used to the controls, I'll think you really enjoy this game. It's a quick pickup and race game, and quite challenging. This is The Dark originally released in 1997 by Oleg Origin, and re-released in 2016. Instead of me telling you what the plot is, I'll let the game do it for you. Very impressive, considering this is just a 48k game. Onto the game itself then, and wow, yeah, very impressive 3D action game here that many Spectrum fans have dubbed the specky version of Doom. It's not actually like Doom, but it's very impressive nonetheless. You travel through a 3D world looking for the exit, and usually have to locate keys to open up a gate. The keys are those handprints in the wall. You're not alone in this world though, and there are beasts that are not happy with you being there. You are initially armed with just a pitchfork, or a trident, and you have to stab away until they drop dead. Soon though, you'll find a gun, which makes dispatching the enemies much easier. You still have to keep out of their way though, so it's a dodge and attack strategy. It's not as easy as it seems, and I didn't get very far in my first few attempts, or in fact many attempts after that, until I'd located the gun. You can view the map at any time, and this indicates keys and exits as well as trees and other items. The game pauses when viewing the map too, so you can use this to take a breather. Back to the game, and the graphics as you can see are great. Very colourful enemies wander around, and everything is as smooth as it can be for a colour 3D game. Sound is used well, with background effects and footsteps, as well as firing and death sounds, and the control is responsive. 
This is not an easy game, at least for me, but it's well worth playing just to see the specky playing a 3D shooter. Definitely want to give a go then, although it didn't seem to like my plus two machine. There are 101 Jet Set Willy mods on the world of Spectrum. I've played them all, and these are some of my favourites. Today we're going to take a look at Vampire Hunter Willy. Vampire Hunter Willy was released in 2011 by Simon D. Lee. Now I haven't been able to find much more information about Vampire Hunter Willy on the internet. There are a couple of YouTube videos of it, but that's it. There's no background story about this. From the name and from the game itself, it's easy to see that this game has a gothic influence. Simon has written one other Jet Set Willy mod, which is Jet Set Willy meets the Beatles. And of the two, I prefer this, which is why it made it into the list. And this is a, another cracking Jet Set Willy mod. This is another Jet Set Willy mod that uses the 128K Jet Set Willy engine and as such has improved music, so the music isn't the kind of beepy Hall of the Mountain King style music from Jet Set Willy or Manic Miner. This is improved sound using the 128K's much improved sound chip. And while that's nice to have, it's not the reason I picked this game. The reason I picked this game is I started playing this and as I've said before many times in this series I just kept wanting to play, I wanted to see what was next. The map of the game is good, it's about the same size as the original Jet Set Willy so there aren't a huge number of additional screens in the game. That 1 to 8k, the extra k that you get from that hasn't been used in adding a huge number of additional screens to the game. Which I'm glad to say actually, I think if the game had too many more screens then it would get a bit cumbersome. So when you start playing this game you start in the mountain entrance and you go into the into the depth screen. And one of the first things I really liked about that screen was the moon. The moon is animated and is done really really well. It's only a few pixels wide, it's, it's more than an 8x8 block, it's probably a 16x16 16 16 block looking at it, but it is really really well done. And that theme kind of continues throughout the game. There are lots of really nice little animated pieces in the game and lots of nice clever animations as well. The next thing you notice in this game is, when you come to get through it, you kind of, well hold on, where do I go next? This looks like a dead end. You've got to jump through some some of those blocks that let you walk past them but you can jump onto to get the item that's in this room and then to get to the exit in the room. And that continues a theme in this game that goes on quite a bit, which is navigating the map and getting from one room to another sometimes can be a little bit tricky. I haven't managed to find every single game in the room yet, or I haven't managed to find every single one that I can see on the map. And then you start to traverse the map, as I say, and you find some more really, really good rooms. I really like the room called Heir to the Dark Throne, which has written in really large letters across the top of the room, a loot card. Fans of the Castlevania series will know it is one of the protagonists in that series and is the main protagonist in Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which is, of course, a very, very well-regarded Castlevania game. I really like Castlevania games, in fact I really like Metroidvania games. And maybe it's because I like those games and the gothic feel to them that I like this game. One thing that there is a lot of in this game is something that's been in previous games that I've reviewed, which is the very, very large figures in a room. So there's a room called Shadow of the Past that looks a lot like the Central Cavern, which has a huge big rendition of Minor Willy in it. There's one called Ancestral Remains that has a kind of medieval looking willy. Then there's Acquaintances Forgotten that has a rendition of Technician Ted. And that theme just continues. There are other rooms that have like big figures in them that aren't anything to do with Jet Set Willy per se, they're just there. A very notable room and one which has its own videos on YouTube is called 8-Bit Hell. 
which has a depiction of the C64 symbol or the Commodore symbol from the C64 in it. When I found that room I had a little chuckle to myself. Another room that I really like or dislike to be honest with you is one called Why Won't You Die? Now there is some secret to that room I don't think I figured out yet because when you go into that room you just die. There's a kind of timer on the room and after so many seconds you die. A bit like the Donkey Kong kill screen. Now the thing about this game is I could probably continue all day talking about particular rooms and why I like them. As I said at the start, you start playing it and you just think, oh what's next? Let me find another room. Let me see what's just beyond this horizon and you just keep doing that. So that's Vampire Hunter Willy. Well worth seeking out if you're a Jet Set Willy fan. Or if you're a fan of Castlevania games or just gothic themed games in general. Till next time, happy gaming! Is there anyone who doesn't know the game Cookie? In 1983, Ultimate Play the Game released four games onto the market to announce their arrival and push game quality out of the Dark Ages. Cookie was one of them, and was released on ROM cartridge as well. The game itself sees you controlling a chef, trying to bake a pie. Each set of ingredients appear in turn from the cupboard on the right hand side, and you have to force them into the mixing bowl by throwing bags of flour at them. Ingredients can only get into the bowl if they've been hit by the flour, so you just have to let them float around until you can get your aim in. Each ingredient is progressively harder to beat, and there are other things to avoid too, like the bin monsters throwing bits of garbage at you. If any of this garbage lands in the bowl, then the ingredient count goes up. The count that is displayed in the bowl indicates how many ingredients you have to get in to get onto the next level. If you manage to get all five ingredients in, the pie is baked and the game begins again. The graphics, as you can see, are top notch, smooth movement and well defined, and easy to control. Sound is also good, with occasional music and nice spot effects, everything that you'd expect from an ultimate game. I like the early ultimate titles, there's a certain charm to them, and I definitely keep going back to them. A golden oldie then, that's definitely worth a quick play. Anybody who bought the design design game Darkstar when it was released not only got a fine game, but also a nice hidden secret. After the game on the tape was another program, and when loaded it asked for a password. Initially no one knew it, but eventually it was published, and when typed in, presented the user with a page of teletext. It worked just like the real teletext too, you typed in a page number, and when the counter reached that number, the page was displayed. Reading deeper, this was a sort of energy release for the programmers, somewhere to record their frustrations and have a laugh after long coding sessions. It pokes fun at anybody and everybody, including Ultimate Play the Game, MSX, Imagine, Computer and Video Games Magazine, and the programmers themselves. It is, of course, silent, so I've stuck some music in the background for you, but when I first got into this, I was amazed. I read it and read it, and still do today. Maybe it was because, at the time, some of the things mentioned were actually happening, like the dispute about review scores in Computer and Video Games magazine. Or maybe it was because I wanted to be a games developer myself, and found the descriptions of everyday life enthralling. But this was, and still is, a damn fine read for me. It's great to grab a glass of beer, sit down and just trawl through every page either in order or randomly. Some pages are not marked from the index, and some continue from previous pages.
If you feel things are a little slow, you can always speed up your emulator so the pages load faster. So, if you ever find yourself with a bit of spare time, and you were around in the early 80s, this will bring back a lot of memories and give you a laugh at the same time. Enjoy!